Okay, let's get to work. We want to turn now to the issue of eminent domain, which is being debated right here in New Hampshire. And Josh McKelvin is the political director, the anchor of WMUR-TV. Josh? Thank you, David, and good evening, candidates. Mr. Trump, you have said, quote, I love eminent domain, which is the seizure of private property for the sake of the greater good, theoretically. You've tried to use the measure in business endeavors. You've said you'd support its use for the Keystone Pipeline Project. Here in New Hampshire, a project, though, known as the Northern Pass, would bring hydroelectric power from Canada into the northeastern grid. Do you see eminent domain as an appropriate tool to get that project done? Well, well, let me just tell you about eminent domain, because almost all of these people actually criticize it. But so many people have hit me with commercials and other things about eminent domain. Eminent domain is an absolute necessity for a country, for our country. Without it, you wouldn't have roads, you wouldn't have hospitals, you wouldn't have anything. You wouldn't have schools, you wouldn't have bridges. You need eminent domain. And a lot of the big conservatives that tell me how conservative they are, I think I'm more than they are, they tell me, oh, well, they all want the Keystone Pipeline. The Keystone Pipeline, without eminent domain, it wouldn't go 10 feet, okay? You need eminent domain. And eminent domain is a good thing, not a bad thing. And what a lot of people don't know, because they were all saying, oh, you're going to take their property. When somebody, when eminent domain is used on somebody's property, that person gets a fortune. They get at least fair market value. And if they're smart, they'll get two or three times the value of their property. But without eminent domain, you don't have roads, highways, schools, bridges, or anything. So eminent domain, it's not that I love it, but eminent domain is absolutely, it's a necessity for a country, and certainly it's a necessity for our country. Yes. The difference between eminent domain for public purpose, as Donald said, roads and infrastructure, pipelines and all that, that's for public purpose. But what Donald Trump did was use eminent domain to try to take the property of an elderly woman on the strip in Atlantic City. That is not public purpose. That is downright wrong. So here's the problem with that. Right. To turn this into a limousine parking lot for his casinos is not a public use. And in Florida, based on what we did, we made that impossible. It is part of our Constitution. That's the better approach. That is the conservative approach. So uh, eminent domain will be a big part of our, our discussion today. This, this class and Thursday, we're going to be concerned with privatization at home and abroad. Um, today we're going to focus on what is privatization, first of all. Uh, then we're going to revisit neoliberalism and the Washington Consensus, both of which feature privatization centrally in their recommendations. And that'll be some conceptual table setting for what's coming later. Then we will talk in some detail about the politics, law, and economics of um, eminent domain, um, followed by privatization in the realm of utilities and local government, with some links that might not be immediately apparent to you yet to uh, last Thursday's lecture on Proposition 13 and the anti-tax movement. And then on Thursday, we will deal with the trend towards private sector prisons and privatization of the military, both of which have been, um, uh, th both of which have, have been led by the U.S., but they're going on in many other parts of the world. So that's our agenda for the next cu couple of sessions. Privatization means a lot of different things, and I want to just start out by distinguishing some of them with, with a, a kind of conceptual map of privatization. So when, when we, we think back to the early lectures of this course, we talked about the post-communist privatizations. This was the era after 1989 of creating market systems de novo, uh, which meant creating private property rights, the enforcement of private contracts, systems of adjudication, and so on. And as we, this is just reviewing uh, what was involved in those debates about creating a private economy, the basic disagreement um, in, in privatizing things like oil, mining, heavy industries, retail services, basic property rights, the basic disagreement was between the shock therapists on the one hand and the 
um, gradualists on the other. And we worked through those debates when we talked about China, Vietnam, and modernization theory and all of that, and the, particularly the, the rather simplistic view that if you democratized a country before you had completed the uh, transformation of the economy, the transformation would never occur, and so uh, it was important to really to do the economy first and do the democracy later, and we saw that um, the upshot of those debates, 20 years later, they washed out in Eastern Europe so that countries like Czechoslovakia, which had been gradual in their economic transformation, certainly didn't seem to be performing any worse than countries like Poland that had gone for shock therapy. And um, indeed, by some measures, including poverty um, and inequality, you might say the Czech economy is more uh, appealing. Um, but then with a focus on China and Vietnam, the question might be also that if you, if you wait to democratize, uh, it might be waiting for Godot. It might never actually arise. So now we're going to be focusing on different privatization. Uh, this is what, what sometimes gets called neoliberal privatization. And that, too, includes a lot of quite disparate things. So um, one is privatization, as in the Thatcher and uh, Reagan, and as we saw even in the, the Blair um, and Clinton eras, of previously uh, public sector or nationalized industries, things like transportation. British Rail, which was nationalized in uh, 1948, was denationalized in 1984. It was reprivatized. Many countries have privatized their mail systems in whole or in part. And then uh, what we're going to talk about today, um, privatization of utilities, privatization of many of the instrumentalities of local government. Um, but there have been other kinds of privatizations, much more central to the traditional functions of government. So uh, under the heading that I'm going to call privatization of public authority, we've had things like much more use of private arbitration in solving government uh, disputes. We're going to talk about eminent domain, the use of eminent domain, as Donald Trump was being accused of in that video to facilitate uh, the private transactions of individuals or individual corporations. Um, another form that I'm not going to spend time on but just want to put on the list there is the increasing role of lobbyists in actually writing legislation. More and more legislation in Washington is not written by staffers, it's actually written by lobbyists, so the private sector is getting more centrally involved in the uh, wielding of public authority through the legislature. And then we might say, uh, even further into the traditional conception of government than that, the privatization of core state functions. And here we think of things like policing, prisons, and the military, and those are going to be our topic on Thursday. So, as I said, this is a, a word with many meanings, and that's fine. They, they bear a family resemblance to one another, but they are all different, and it's important to keep those differences distinct. So, let's revisit the, the larger um, political and ideological framework within which these debates have been going on. And I talked earlier about what was what I called neoliberalism at home and the Washington consensus abroad. Pretty much the same basket of policies. But let me ask a question. When I say the word neoliberalism, how many people had never heard of it before you have entered this classroom? Okay, so most people have heard of it. Okay. Those who had heard it, how many think it's a pejorative term? Pejorative term? Not pejorative term? Not pejorative? Not sure? 
Okay, so they're not, they're not sure as have it. Okay, what about Washington consensus? Pejorative term, fewer think it's pejorative than the neoliberalism. Not pejorative, not sure. Okay, um, so that, that's helpful. Um, so, I, I, and I think what we saw in, in the room is reflective of general opinion. I think that more people tend to think of neoliberalism as a pejorative term than the Washington Consensus as a pejorative term. Though it's interesting, and it might be a reflection of our own um, sort of navel-gazing myopia, that they're pretty much the same policies. It's just when you call it for the Washington Consensus, you're saying other people should abide by these policies. When you say neoliberalism, you're saying we should be abiding by these policies. And um, so uh, they come with a certain amount of freight. They are descriptive, but they are, they are normatively loaded. Um, and the, the three components that I've mentioned to them, mentioned several times to you, one is the idea of getting rid of regulations, cutting back on government regulation of the economy. The second is privatization that we're talking about today. And the third is, is free trade. And these were the main components of the neoliberal agendas of the Reagans and the Thatchers and the Blairs and the Clintons. And they were also uh, the main components of what came to be called uh, the Washington Consensus. Um, and they were, part of my message here is that they were hegemonic until the financial crisis, at, after which they began to fray. And we have mostly been in this class so far talking about the run-up to the financial crisis when neoliberalism at home and the Washington Consensus abroad did enjoy virtual hegemony. Um, you will see as the course goes on that they fray, the, the component pieces actually fray at different rates. That after the financial crisis, um, the, first, the first on the chopping block, so to speak, was deregulation and we got significant new legislation to regulate the economy, the Dodd-Frank bill here, similar legislation in the UK and in many other countries. So there was a certain, there was a backlash against the deregulatory agenda of the, um, of the early post-Cold War period, uh, right after the financial crisis. Privatization has always been messier and more contentious, as we'll see today. Um, but the, the backlash against privatization, and we're going to see some of it setting in, actually, even, uh, even before the financial crisis, um, in the rest of today's discussion. But free trade doesn't really get its comeuppance until 2016, when uh, you get the resurgence of protection, frankly, avowedly protectionist economics. Not, there, may, there are many countries which say they're for free trade and surreptitiously have protections, but the idea that governments should really protect their, uh, their own infant industries at least, and perhaps more, uh, gains real currency uh, much, much later. So those are some of the upcoming topics. But let's start uh, by observing what's been implicit in what I've just been saying, that even when an, idea, an ideology is hegemonic, such as neoliberalism or the Washington Consensus, um, hegemony is never complete. The, the most subtle philosophical reflection on this subject is Michael Walls's Tanner Lectures, which he gave at Harvard in 1984 and appeared as this excellent little book, Interpretation and Social Criticism, published by Harvard University Press three years later, in which he makes the case that however hegemonic a system of ideas seems to be, there are always internal resources within it that enable criticism of it and the possibility of changing it into something different. His, his phrase is imminent criticism. And, the, and there was always going to be room for imminent criticism of the Washington Consensus. So um, 
Another thing to say is that, and this is I think reflected in the different uh, reactions to the, the ideological valence of neoliberalism and the Washington Consensus, when I said we tend to think of the Washington Consensus as what other people should, should do. And uh, of course, we don't know how those other people necessarily think of it. So let's, let's get a bit of a, a grip on some of that. When Bolivia sought to refinance the public water service of its third largest city, the World Bank required that it be privatized, which is how the Bechtel Corporation of San Francisco gained control over all of Cochabamba's water, even that which fell from the sky. Esta ley, este contrato, prohibían a la gente acumular el agua de la lluvia. Por lo tanto, el agua de la lluvia también se privatizaba. La factura de agua le daba un valor legal a la empresa para que pueda apropiarse de su, de su propiedad, de su vivienda, rematando la misma. La gente debía eh, optar por una decisión de comer menos, pagar del agua, pagar por los servicios básicos, dejar de mandar a los niños a la escuela, eh, no asistir a los hospitales y curarse en la propia casa, o en todo caso, eh, gente jubilada, por ejemplo, que tiene una renta muy, muy baja, debería eh, buscar trabajo en las calles. la consigna de el agua es nuestra carajo, la gente sale a las calles, sale a los caminos y eh, protesta. ¿no? The price this beleaguered country paid for World Bank loans was the privatization of the state oil industry and its airline, railroad, electric and phone companies. But the government failed to convince Bolivians that water is a commodity like any other. Entonces, eh, ahí sí eh, vimos eh, que el gobierno defendía los intereses de la transnacional Bechtel porque la gente quería agua, no gases. La gente quería justicia y no balas. Estas son las imágenes que reflejan definitivamente la situación que vivió Cochabamba durante la jornada de este viernes. Bolivia was determined to defend the corporation's right to charge families living on two dollars a day as much as one quarter of their income for water. The greater the popular resistance to the water privatization scheme, the more violent became the standoff. So um, this was privatization of the water in Kutcher in uh, Cochabamba, Bolivia, in uh, attempted um, at the end of the last century by this corporation Bechtel out of San Francisco. And um, this is just to give you a sense of how squarely in the mainstream of Washington consensus um, privatizations this was, that water privatization had been occurring in, in much of the developing world uh, since the early 1990s, and as, as was said in the video, it was one of the standard things that was urged upon, uh, was urged upon developing country governments as conditions for getting aid in addition to other kinds of privatization. But you can see that even in uh, countries like Britain and France, um, we've seen increased privatization of uh, things like water supply uh, in, during this period. And interestingly, there were very considerable efficiency gains from this privatization. In Cochabamba, there, there had been a lot of, uh, a lot of people who were the, without water, um, or had water, water one or two days a week, and um, the Bechtel Corporation put together a big consortium. They bid for this contract. It, it might have been wise for them to become nervous when they discovered nobody else was bidding for this contract. Um, but they didn't, they went ahead and did it, and as you saw, what, what basically happened was as, as the uh, 
water came on stream, that produced more demand for the water, and the, the part of their deal with the Bolivian government was that they were going to earn back uh, their revenue from selling the water. And of course, the price of the water then went up because there was increased demand for the water. And this um, Oscar Oliveira, who you saw in the, uh, in the video, he didn't look so charismatic in that video, but in fact he's an extremely charismatic uh, and dynamic labor leader. He pretty much single-handedly led the fight against Bechtel. And uh, as you saw, the, the government started out trying to protect the company. Um, and this led to the massive confrontations with these farmers and peasants and others who uh, thought they, as, as was said in, in the video, they thought, we have a right to this water. The notion that, that people can make money out of um, selling us our own water uh, we, we became an inc incredibly effective rallying cry um, to the point where um, the government finally gave up and uh, backed down and re-nationalized the water supply. And the, what happened with Bechtel was uh, the Bolivian government just called them up one day and said, we really don't think we can protect your people and your property uh, anymore. So you better uh, act accordingly. And they packed up and left. Um, they then spent the next five or six years in litigation over uh, $50 million, which they were, ho were hoping to get back to com compensate them for their sunk cost. Uh, finally, they gave up. There's a wonderful New, York, New Yorker article, which I should have put on the syllabus, called Leasing the Rain, uh, which I will uh, I'll, I'll post uh, in case anybody is interested that, that goes through this story. But so here you have uh, people thinking that even though this was a, a, an efficiency enhancing privatization, the costs of it were not worth having. And indeed, some people thought it was something obnoxious about the very fact of privatizing control of water. Reminds, you might say it reminds one of John Locke's definition of domination in the first treatise on government where he defines domination as being in a position to take advantage of another's necessity. Water is a necessity. Um, and so clearly people like that felt this way. And interestingly, it's not just Bolivia. Um, the week before last, the former Tory MP, Rory Stewart, kicked out of the party by Boris Johnson as one of the 21. Uh, who, who, very interesting man, by the way. He, he, uh, he's this, he, once walked, he once walked across Afghanistan, wrote a book about it. But in any event, he was here giving a lecture, and he talked about the privatization of water supply in the UK. And he said exactly what I just said to you here. He said that actually it's been an efficiently enhancing. Uh, in this case, it's, even, it's, it's uh, not more expensive than it was before, and, and the delivery is better. But there's still huge opposition to it uh, among many British voters on the grounds that they don't believe that water should be some supplying people water to drink uh, should be uh, something out of which money can be made. So we'll come back to, to public opinion uh, about privatization when, we have, when we've considered a few more examples. But let's move on to talking about eminent domain. Um, what is eminent domain? Somebody, what is eminent domain? As opposed to non-eminent. Exactly. So the, the right of the government to take private property for a public good. You said a public good. We're going to have to spend a little time digging into what counts as a public good. But in, 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 um, in keeping with my idea to avoid theorizing before we've got some 
uh, empirical things out on the table. Let's start in India now, and we will talk about privatizing eminent domain, this use of government power to um, actually do things that are a little more in the direction of what Donald Trump was being accused of by Jeb Bush in that opening debate. So in India, in 1984, they, they had something, they had an a, a almost century old land acquisition act, uh, which took this term public purpose and broadened it to include promoting exports, investments, and public infrastructure. Um, so this is, starts to broaden the idea. And then um, in 2007, they widened it further by saying, any purpose useful to the general public will be counted as um, allowing the use of eminent domain. And then they, they set up a, a, a rule that worked the following way, because the difficulty with India from the point of view of development is that um, there are millions of very tiny plots. Uh, land ownership is, is highly, um, highly divided up into very small pieces of ground. And obviously that means if you're going to use the power of eminent domain, uh, you're going to have to deal with a lot of landowners, a lot of homeowners, millions maybe even uh, for some of the more ambitious ones. And part of what was going on in the early post-Cold War period was that governments were trying to create special economic zones. Um, and we're going to talk more about them in other parts of the world later in the course, including in Africa. But the idea of a special economic zone would be an area in which it was essentially to be a, a magnet for capital. So they would say, well, if you come and invest in our special economic zone, we'll give you regulatory breaks, we'll give you tax breaks, we will um, protect you from strikes by unions. They are often, therefore, criticized on the left. But just to give you a sense, uh, since, um, since 19, the late 80s, the special economic zones have just taken off worldwide. Um, as uh, attempts to jumpstart economies by uh, creating these, th these uh, if you like, islands that are supposed to magnetically attract capital. Very popular with governments. Um, they're sometimes called uh, development zones in the US. Very popular often with governments, not so much with economists. Most, ec the, most economists think that special economic zones don't really work um, for a variety of reasons that needn't concern us. Perhaps the, the biggest exception is China, where the special economic zones are enormous, and uh, they, are, they are essentially sort of integrated mini economies. And as I mentioned in my lecture about China, the original idea behind the Chinese special economic zones was actually islands of experimentation with capitalism. They wanted to, to try out uh, capitalist uh, economies without um, transforming the whole Chinese economy. This was part of their experimentalism. And of course, in China, there was not much of a, a problem about moving people around uh, if they were disinclined to move. But so if you, if you look at the difference between uh, in the red box here on this slide, um, the Chinese and the Indian special economic zones. You can see that um, the Chinese ones were, were enormous, 300 square kilometers, whereas the typical Indian one was 1.4 square kilometers. So um, India has this basic problem that if if they want to create special economic zones and they want to use eminent domain to do that, uh, and it's a democracy where there's strong tradition of citizen uh, opposition to things that they don't like, how are you going to do it? So they came up with this 70% rule. And the 70% rule basically said the following. It said, if a private developer uh, 
can buy up 70% of the land for a prospective development, whether it's for a single uh, company, plant, or for a special economic zone, then the local government will come in and compulsorily purchase the other 30%, and then sell it that 30%, uh, that 30% would be sold to the company. Uh, and so you can see what the logic would be here, that in order to buy the first 70%, the company would have had to have done a lot of work on the ground with the local people and gotten enough, uh, very significant showing of support for what they were going to be doing. Um, but then there's the obvious problem of holdouts, that uh, it, it, the more you become the veto player, or the possible veto player on... Um, the, the decision of this project to, do, to move forward, the more you can ransom the whole project by demanding a very high price for a market transaction. And so the thought was, didn't seem crazy at the time, the thought was the 70% rule will do it. It, it sort of uh, splits the difference, it forces the companies to do a lot of work with the citizenry, but it also uh, solves the problem of um, Holdouts. So uh, this is what uh, came to a head in the province of, of, of Singur in West Bengal uh, early on in this century. And so uh, the Tata Corporation wanted to build something called the Nano. Anyone know what the, the Tata Nano was? Yeah. The world's cheapest car. Uh, and they're, they're, I, this was their marketing, their marketing ploy. They wanted to build the world's cheapest car. It was going to cost about $2,500, and they thought this would be, it was so, it, I guess it was sort of the VW Beetle for the 21st century. Um, though when we see what, what happened to the VW Beetle in the run-up to World War II, uh, that might have uh, been a cause for worry, uh, at least, um, for, for Tata, but in any event, they decided they were going to they they were going to uh, build this world's cheapest car for the Indian mass market, and then the, the next question was where to build it, um, and so they decided they would build it in West Bengal. West Bengal was was interesting for uh, a number of reasons, um, and they'd had bids from other parts of the country as well. But uh, the, the area of West Bengal in which they were planning to build it, uh, very consistent with the themes of this course, had, was governed by a communist party that had got the zeal of a convert about capitalism. Uh, and so even though it was, it was governed by a communist party, uh, they wanted to get this plant. They wanted to get Tata to come and build uh, this plant. And so uh, taught, they worked with uh, the company and uh, they, the company began buying up land and uh, at, when they passed the 70% threshold, the single government in, of West Bengal uh, compulsory purchased the rest and the, the project began. Um, so, just to give you a sense of how it played out. In the countryside outside Calcutta, the electoral battle has turned decidedly nasty, highlighting some of the problems of India's industrial expansion. Five years ago, the communist government of West Bengal moved thousands of farmers off their land to make way for a giant car factory owned by the Indian conglomerate Tata. Some of the farmers, like Mahadev Das, weren't even compensated. সেই পুঁজিপতি সার্থে জমি কেড়ে নিতে যেহেতু কৃষকের ঘরে এরকম পুলিশি আক্রমণ নামিয়ে নিয়ে আসে সেই সরকার কি আর জনগণ রাখে সেন্সিং আ পলিটিক্যাল কু 
the opposition party backed the farmers. So there you see democracy at work because it turned out that this plant was in a very marginal constituency. Uh, it, had been, it had been won by uh, literally uh, a handful of votes uh, by the Communist Party in the previous election. And the opposition saw this as an opportunity to uh, unhorse the government. And so they got behind, uh, and, and there was, a, just as with uh, in the Bechtel case, there was a very charismatic opposition politician who uh, got behind this cause, and the farmers began not only uh, complaining, but actually attacking the plant. It's a visit from the MD of Tata Motors that caused this violence. While Ravi Kant was in the plant assessing its progress, outside the plant, 200 villagers tried to storm in. Police and the protesters engaged in clashes for over an hour as tear gas shells were fired, which injured two policemen besides some farmers. Even as the situation was brought under control, the protesters made it difficult for the MD to leave the area, setting up blockades along the highway. According to the villagers, this kind of sporadic violence will continue in and around Singur. Many farmers are agitated because they didn't get jobs as they were from. The tension in Singur is unlikely to ebb soon. With Shambhat Pal in Kolkata, Sonorita Chauhan, Times Now. And so uh, it played out very similarly to the efforts in Bolivia. It turned out that even though the government became more and more repressive, there came a point where the cost was too great and uh, the, the, there was something of a standoff. And finally, Tata said, we've had enough. Um, and they announced that they were leaving West Bengal uh, and they, the, as you can see, it, it's, one, it's not one of the poorest um, parts of India, but they moved to right across the country to Gujarat, which is sig significantly uh, more developed, and they built the Tata Nano there. So, um, the whole issue that became the flashpoint was this idea of just compensation. And um, you might wonder about how, how it was conceived of and why it became such a flashpoint. Because if 70% of the farmers had actually already sold their property and um, it was only the remaining 30 who were being forced to sell, uh, you would think that the politics of this could have been managed. Um, but here are some, some inconvenient facts that got in the way of this uh, transaction being successful. And um, one is that India is a relatively weak state, and one of the ways in which it's weak is that people avoid taxes by uh, when they transfer land, they have an official price and an unofficial price. And the unofficial price is higher than the official price, because the, the official price is used to calculate taxes. But of course, when, um, when the government compensated people for the land they were taking, they would, ta they would use the official price. And so people felt like they were not getting the value of their land. To make matters worse, once Tata announced the project, uh, the, the, that the project was going forward, the price of land immediately started to skyrocket. And so the, the people who had sold their land earlier felt like they were now getting screwed because the, they, were, they had so, sold it for a much lower price than was available uh, on the open market once the project had been announced. And to exacerbate that problem, um, some people who figured out what was coming down ran, sort of uh, became middlemen and ran around buying up lots of land 
uh, so that they could bid up the price and sell it later. And so um, this really meant that the, the moral, the, the um, 70% rule created a kind of moral hazard because it meant that people could hold out for a higher price uh, even though it was intended to defeat the holdout problem. Um, and then finally, and perhaps as you saw from the interview with that farmer, um, many of these, these farmers who were being thrown off the land were not going to get jobs working in the Tata plant. Uh, that was semi-skilled work. These were farmers. Um, and so what were they actually going to do, uh, even if they had been compensated for their land? So, uh, you know, uh, Rajan Tata, that's him there, uh, CEO of Tata, actually a very well-respected and well-liked company in India. So this was quite an unusual um, uh, catastrophe for them. Even though he left $350 million on the table in West Bengal, he decided he cut his losses, and here you can see the plant opening in Gujarat. Uh, a footnote to this story is that, uh, that th this is the first nano being produced in Gujarat, but it turned out that it was not a successful car, by the way. Uh, the, the reason being that uh, people don't want to be driving the world's cheapest car. <laughs> they, 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 they think it, it, you know, the world is a status economy as well as an economic economy, and uh, so th they, they've done many backflips to try and uh, rescue the, the Nana, but uh, it hasn't been an economic success. And um, unfortunately, though, this is what's left of the defunct plant in West Bengal. Um, the land continued to belong to the Tata Corporation, and most of it has not gone back to farming. Um, so here again you see a case where um, the losers from a privatization effort uh, using the, the, I, the concept of eminent domain as a vehicle for promoting economic development backfires because the people who are going to be harmed by it or who believe they're going to be harmed by it uh, get uh, mobilized uh, and, and incidentally, the opposition party did knock off the communist government in the next election. Uh, so it, it worked uh, to that extent. So these are, th these are some cases, the Bolivia and the Indian case, to remind us that when we talk about neoliberalism and the Washington consensus, we should always re remember that it's important to think about how these things look from other parts of the world and not just uh, as they are articulated by policy wonks in Washington or in the World Bank uh, or among uh, Western academics. So let's talk about the U.S., privatizing eminent domain in the U.S. Now we have, uh, we have something called the takings clause uh, in the Fifth Amendment and the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment for the lawyers here will know. Uh, the due process clause of the 14th Amendment applies the Fifth Amendment to the states and it says that people will, shall, the, the last clause of it, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Um, so we've seen that in India, they had this very capacious definition of public use to enable economic development in uh, West Bengal uh, that produced a certain amount of backlash. But how should we think about public use? What is a public use? You know, many people would say, well, you know, Donald Trump's casinos aren't public use either. So wh what is a public use? How do we how do we know a public use when we trip over it? Benefits the Pardon? Benefits the, Benefits the public. Okay. Well, um, 
that could be that could be part of it, but presumably, you know, economic growth benefits the public, and uh, this was the 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 you know the the argument for um, for what was being done in West Bengal. What, what what more can we say about public? A public entity, like a school. A school. Um, well, there are a lot of private schools, but uh, yeah, okay. So one one place one might start. We shouldn't always start with the economists, but the economists have a definition of a public good. Can anyone tell me what is a what would an economist tell us is a public good? Yeah. Okay, so you said um, non-excludable was your second criterion. What does that mean? If if we create clean air for for you, we can't exclude the person sitting next to you from having the clean air as well, right? So that's that's one feature of the definition of a public good. You, if you provide it everybody's going to get the benefit of it. So that obviously creates incentive to free ride, because if I'm going to get the benefit anyway, why would I pay for it um, if somebody else is, is going to pay to provide it? So that's one element of a public good. And then you, you said the, the other element? Right, uh, sometimes non-rivalrous. What, and what does that mean? What does non-competitive or non-rivalrous mean, somebody? Some economist. Have I frightened every economist out of here already? Yeah, but it's basically the idea is that my having it doesn't um, stop you enjoying it. So sunshine, I, my consuming sunshine doesn't stop you consuming Sunshine, right? So uh, it, it's it, we we don't we don't need we're not we're not rivals for the sunshine, right? Um, so that that's the idea of a of a public good. But notice that even if you start with such an, this narrow this narrow technical definition of a public good of things that are non-rivalrous and um, non-excludable. Um, they're still going to be politically charged. Um, why are they going to be politically charged? One is because there are alternatives. So if we think about you know, building a road, if you build a road, anybody can use the road. And if you, if you build a road, uh, my using it doesn't, it doesn't use up the road. You can also use the road. We can't exclude you, and it's non-competitive. But of course, rather than building the road here, we could have built the road someplace else, right? So there's still, there are always going to be alternative courses of action that might have been taken. There is now a plan to build a high-speed rail, which I'm sure will never be built, um, from uh, Washington uh, to Boston. And the current plan goes to Hartford bypassing New Haven, $60 billion um, $60 billion enterprise. And of course, the, the negative externalities of that for Yale would be huge. It would be much better if the high-speed rail went through New Haven. So even when you're providing what is technically understood as a public good, there, there always more, there's always going to be more than one way to provide it, and um, there'll be winners and losers depending on which way is chosen. Then secondly, there are going to be externalities, what economists call externalities. There are going to be costs, wherever you put it, that some people will have to bear. Right? So even if it had been the case that the Tata plant in West Bengal would have jump-started the economy, brought lots of employment, would have brought other industries to the region, would have been a net benefit by just about any definition, these farmers would still have paid a substantial price because they were getting kicked off their land and they were not likely to be employable in the new industries. So even if on net um, 
we say that uh, providing a public good uh, is, is desirable, it's still going to have externalities. And you have to worry about the externalities. And then finally, you're going to have the problems of valuation that we talked about before. When, when you do eminent domain, it's compulsory purchase, and so you have to decide uh, what is the right value. And of course, there are various mechanisms for doing that, looking at the value of houses around the house that you're going to compulsory purchase. Um, but uh, the mar there may be problems with the market, or at least the the people living in the house may perceive problems with the market, or it may be that I was born in this house, my grandmother was born in this house, I value this house differently than uh, I could sell it for on the market. And so you're going to get those sorts of problems. And the, the sorts of, if you try and get around the holdout problem with something like India's 70% rule, uh, you're not going to persuade the holdouts. In fact, you just, what you basically do is you, you shift the holdout problem to near the 70% threshold rather than near the 100% threshold. So there's, there's going to be, um, even if you start with a very narrow definition of public purpose, it's always going to be politically charged. And, and in reality, uh, there's almost no government in the world that sticks to such a narrow definition of a public purpose um, as a technically uh, what counts as a uh, public good. So this all came to a head in Connecticut, here in Connecticut, uh, 14 years ago in a case called Kello versus the city of New London. And it was a very interesting and, and controversial case because it was uh, exactly the use of eminent domain to facilitate a purely private transaction. Um, basically, the, the, the city of Kello, which, which was not a blighted area, there had been some previous Supreme Court decisions which had said if, if an area is truly blighted, uh, then compulsory purchasing can be done if there's some plan to um, revitalize it. But um, this was, uh, was, not, was not an area of blight. And by the way, uh, anyone who knows about the history of debates about urban renewal will know that even uh, compulsory purchase of blighted areas, go take a look at the remains of the Oak Street Connector in downtown New Haven, uh, or read Douglas Ray's brilliant book called City, Urbanism and Its End, if you want to know about um, urban blight uh, as not being eradicated successfully through eminent domain purchases. In any event, uh, this went way beyond blight, and the city of New London had an offer to build a shopping mall. And uh, they used the eminent domain power uh, to force that transaction through. And they compulsory purchased some homes, forced people out of them, and uh, compensated them, and um, justified them. Of course, they were sued. It was sued, worked its way up uh, through the courts in Connecticut. Um, but the defense of it was that it would bring economic growth, employment, and higher tax revenues for the city of New London. And what was remarkable about this was it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the, the city of, of New London won. Uh, they won in a five to four decision. Uh, and the decision, interestingly, was written by what we think of, the, of as the less conservative wing of the court in those days. So uh, it was Justice Stevens with Kennedy, uh, Souter, Ginsburg, and Breyer. They all said, well, if careful studies have been done, and it's clearly going to bring economic growth and uh, employment and higher tax revenues to the city of New London, uh, it can go forward. And so it actually survived. And it was the, the conservatives who we tend to think like 
uh, capitalism and like economic development, um, Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, then Chief Justice Rehnquist, Scalia, and Thomas uh, dissented uh, with a strong defense of property rights. As O'Connor put it in her dissent, she said, to reason as the court does that the incidental public benefits resulting from the subsequent ordinary use of private property render economic development takings for public use is to wash out any distinction between private and public use of property and thereby effectively to delete the word for public use from the takings clause of the Fifth Amendment. She's basically saying, once you can do it for this, uh, you can do it for anything. Uh, and so the, the takings clause really doesn't offer much in the way of real protection. Um, so that was a, a pretty dramatic occurrence, right? It's, it's more dramatic than the 70% rule in India. Uh, it's actually saying if, if, a, if a local city government uh, can, can convince itself and you know, perhaps some fact-finding body that this is going to be good for the city, they can compulsory, compulsory purchase land. Um, and though we didn't have riots, the way that we saw riots in Bolivia and we saw riots uh, in, in West Bengal, uh, there was huge backlash to this decision. Um, and interestingly, it was a, a coalition of strange bedfellows that were opposed to this. Uh, it was groups like the AARP, uh, the, the NAACP, the Libertarian Party, uh, and conservative think tanks all came out against it. Um, and President then George W. Bush uh, announced an executive order that federal, federal funds could not be used to facilitate um, private use of eminent domain in this way. And before the Kello decisions, only eight states had had uh, limitations of this sort on the use of eminent domain power uh, to facilitate tri private transactions. As of April of this year, 45 states had enacted curbs upon it. Um, so as you can see, the, the uh, forward use of the eminent domain power actually uh, triggered backlash. And as with the Tata nano plant in Singo, West Bengal, it turns out uh, the development never occurred. Uh, and this, you, you can, there's now a movie uh, about this whole episode uh, which you can watch. So the upshot of this discussion so far is that neither efficiency, as in the case of water privatizations, nor just compensation, even if it's effectuated uh, in terms that uh, an economist uh, would approve of, might be sufficient to grease the wheels of privatization. In fact, you might run into problems. Loss aversion might be more important to people than just compensation. Uh, they, may, uh, they may not want to give up their home, uh, or they may not want to retrain to learn how to work uh, in a car factory. Um, Unanticipated externalities can trigger very effective opposition, particularly when there's a political entrepreneur to, to uh, mobilize that opposition. Um, and the most important takeaway uh, is that there's no technical answer to this question. It's not having the right theoretical model. Uh, this is a, these are just political questions where there are distributive um, benefits and burdens that are going to be borne no matter what's done or what's not done. And so it's really, at the end of the day, political. And in that sense, you can't wring the politics out of politics by trying to have a fancy model uh, to tell you the answer. The answer is going to depend upon uh, figuring out who's going to benefit and who's going to be harmed, and then uh, making sure that the people who are going to be harmed are not mobilized to stop the project, 
uh, possibly by compensating them uh, or by finding out what else you can do to help them. Let's talk about privatizing local government services. Um, there's a link to the previous class in this that we talked about how the agenda of the anti-tax movement was to starve the beast, to reduce the amount of money available to government on the theory that governments either uh, waste it or uh, feather their own nests with it. And if you look, if you go back to, you know, I started with Proposition 13 last time, you can see uh, indeed after, after Proposition 13 was enacted, local government revenues in California just plummeted, um, and cities and counties where, where the, the same kinds of propositions have been adopted have found themselves increasingly starved for revenue. Um, so you can see in the, in the second slide, it's a right-hand slide there, that they've, they, to the extent they can raise revenue, it is, uh, they've, got, they've had to depend on things other than real estate taxes because of the bars on raising money in the ways that they traditionally had done. And if you look at California, uh, the growth, this would make the Proposition 13 crowd happy. Um, California has local government revenues have indeed grown more slowly than elsewhere and contributed to many of its fiscal woes. So one of the ways in which local governments have responded to this reality is by moving towards um, privatizing local government. And what do I mean by that? It's basically th they have moved towards these things that Evan McKenzie writes about called common interest developments. What is a common interest development? Yeah. Right, they're sort of giant condo associations, right, where you, you, own, your, you own your unit and you, that you live in, but you, all, you pay a fee to the, to the association, and the association then um, delivers a lot of services. They arrange for snow removal if it's in New England, not in California, most of California, certainly not Southern California, but they arrange for... Um, garbage pickup, sewage, um, some of them local policing, the, uh, you, can, you can get your hot water through them. So you get um, a lot of services that would traditionally have been provided by local governments from the common interest development, right? And this is obviously attractive to cash-strapped local governments because they find the provision of services expensive. Uh, and now it's much harder, as we've seen, for them to raise revenue in the ways that they typically have done. And so in a lot of these kinds of states, you find cities that actually the, the only form of new housing building they permit is common interest developments. And so to give you some sense of the, the numbers here, they're, they're really quite dramatic. Um, go back to uh, 1964, there were fewer than 500 of them in the country. Um, and you can see um, after the ta anti-tax movement gets going, they just start to skyrocket. And this is now 10 years ago. Uh, this, uh, I couldn't find uh, aggregate statistics for more recently than that. But by 2009, um, we had, uh, you know, 24 and a half million housing units, 60.1 million people, almost a fifth of the American population is now living in these common interest developments. And uh, I'm sure that number is significantly higher today uh, than it was uh, a decade ago. Uh, that's more than the population of many, many countries. 
60 million people are living in these developments. And as I said, a number of cities, particularly in, in California, in Arizona, in Florida, uh, will not allow any other kinds of development. Uh, so it's a big change, right? It's a big change over the last several years, in large part driven by uh, the cost savings for local governments. They, they get to double dip, if you like, because they, they get to, you still have to pay property taxes, uh, but uh, they don't have to provide you with anything like the number of services uh, at, that they have to uh, provide to, to other homeowners. So what should we think about that? What are the consequences of that for democratic politics? Take the microphone, yeah. So they're private, essentially private governments in these developments. They're, they're, they're usually boards, right? Uh, so they're, they're, sometimes they're elected boards, but typically the way it works is the developer creates a board when they're building it, uh, and that board will decide, you know, what, um, what type of housing they're going to build. Is it going to be, is it going to be a development that permits uh, animals, is it going to be a retirement development with no children beyond, below a certain age? What the, the basic structure and rules are going to be, it's going to be set by this board, and then people will have to come in on that basis. Um, and it'll have a, essentially a charter uh, constitution, which will likely be very difficult to change because the, the initial homeowners will not want the rules to be changed on them in midstream. And so you, you're going to essentially have private government of a, it, it's of a lot of local activities. Now some might say, well, so what's wrong with that? You know, uh, people can pick and choose. I mean, you go, go to Fort Lauderdale uh, um, and you can see, um, you know, by the water, these developments go for, you know, millions of dollars and you go, uh, quarter of a mile back and they're cheaper, a quarter of a mile back, they're cheaper, and people could sort into just the kinds of housing that they want. Uh, you know, the market is hunky-dory here. Everybody can, if you, you don't like animals, go live in one that doesn't like animals. If you, if you, doesn't allow animals. If you, uh, you know, if you want access to a swimming pool, you go to one that has swimming pool and you pay a little bit more. Um, so, so you could say, one might say, what, what, there's, no, there's no problem with this. Yeah. One of the bigger issues is the people who are elected to serve on these elected boards might not have the expertise needed to properly run the different utilities or, or any of the different elements of the government, of the internal government. Yeah. So there, be, there can be accountability problems because the boards tend to be run by amateurs, as you say, and they might quite be quite incompetent. They turn out not to be able to manage the accounts and so on. So there, there, there's, you, you know, if, if we had a little bit more time, we could work our way through a number of those kinds of issues that pop up and which have caused uh, a demand uh, for regulating uh, these boards and, and so on. Uh, it, it still could be a, you know, it can be a problem that, you know, your neighbors stop paying their condo fees and the thing goes bankrupt and it's very difficult for you to have redress in these situations. So there, there, there are a lot of those issues. Any other issues we should be thinking about? Yeah, at the back. You have to yell or wait for the microphone. The, the microphone's gotten to you now. I meant that no judges can overturn the decisions of the board. The courts tend not to be involved with this um, CIDs. So uh, you have to explain what you mean. 
so that um, in the readings, uh, there was a lot of people who wanted to sue the, the boards, and the judges said they didn't want to become involved with these um, associations. Yeah, so there's, there's potential for incompetence and corruption and um, related things. That, that, those, those things are all true. However, there's the same potential for all of those things in local government. Um, so I think that the, 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 the things to think about uh, that are going to be significant going forward is, one is the boards can be quite undemocratic because they usually, as I said, uh, the dice is loaded early on. But also, you know, we, we talked earlier about uh, Hirschman's exit cost, uh, exit voice and loyalty. There are problems here about entry um, because if, if all of the housing in a part of the country is built in these developments that pick the markets that they want to serve, what about homeless people? Where are homeless people going to wind up? They're going to wind up on the streets of San Francisco or somewhere like that. That uh, because if you want to buy into one of these places, of course you've got to. You they they don't want you unless they're sure that you can pay. So you you're going to go through uh, financial screening. You're going to have to prove you can afford to live in the place. And people who can't are going to be wind up not being served. There's going to be a big market if you try and do housing through this kind of market. There's going to be a market failure that is going to be probably quite costly uh, for governments to attend to. Um, a third difficulty, um, two related things. One, I mentioned Douglas Ray earlier, but, uh, his book about urban politics, but he has an essay called Tyrannies of Place where he points to the, the fact, quite prescient, he wrote this more than 25 years ago, that we're increasingly becoming a segmented democracy. That is, people tend to spend time around people like themselves. And this, of course, greatly facilitates that because people will sort by income, uh, if, you go, if you go to as the ones in Florida, often by ethnic groups, uh, into these relatively homogeneous, uh, uh, certainly financially homogeneous um, groups. And we know from Kahneman, who I've mentioned to you before, and his research with with um, Cass Sunstein, lately of the federal government and now in the Obama administration, now back at the Harvard Law School. But like-minded people, if they just talk to one another, tend to become more extreme. And so if we get an increasingly segmented democracy uh, of people only hanging around people who, who look and talk like themselves, this will reinforce a lot of the divisions that are contributing to polarization of the electorate. And when we talk uh, next week about the segmentation of media markets, we'll see that this reinforces that trend, that uh, sort of out of sight, out of mind of people not like yourself. Um, so a final point I would make uh, is that these, these organizations are here to stay. If you go back and look at Mackenzie's first book, which he published in 1996, Privatopia, the, the tone of that book is, this is terrible. The sky is falling. These things should be stopped. They, for all the reasons I've mentioned and other reasons. But if you, the, the chapter I gave you from his book uh, of, from 2011, the tone is completely different that, you know, there, there are 25 million of these things here. They're, they're here to stay and figuring out how to manage them and manage with them is really the order of business going forward. Okay, on Thursday we will talk about prisons and the military.